If you're a marketer or business owner, you already know TV advertising is a powerful channel for business growth. It's also a solution for businesses frustrated by digital marketing's rising cost. But the traditional process for launching TV campaigns is expensive, time-consuming, and complex. Marketing Architects believes brands deserve access to quality TV campaigns. That's why they flipped the traditional TV agency model on its head to create all-inclusive TV. With all-inclusive TV advertising, Marketing Architects invest their own money to produce, analyze, and optimize your TV campaign. All you pay for is media. This means you get top-tier solutions for every piece of your campaign, but without the dramatic price tag, setting you up for rapid growth at an extreme cost advantage. In fact, all-inclusive TV is so revolutionary, they wrote a book about it. If you're a marketer, business leader, or interested in the TV advertising industry, you'll want to grab a copy of All Inclusive TV, How Booming Brands Are Reimagining TV Advertising. Read how other brands use TV to transform their businesses and how you can do the same. Go to marketingarchitects.com slash book to get your free copy today. Again, that's marketingarchitects.com slash book. You know I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast. My friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social index now gives you globally earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the top seven social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look-back window over two years of historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the Social Index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com slash Allen. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com slash A-L-A-N. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. On the show today, I've got Lindsay McCormick. She's the founder and CEO of BITE, which stands for Because It's the Earth. They are makers of plastic-free and cruelty-free products on a mission to become the world's most sustainable personal care company. She started her company in her living room with about $6,000 in savings, and since Lindsay has built it to a multi-million dollar company aimed at getting plastic out of our everyday routines, with her first product being a viral toothpaste tablets in 2018. And since then, Byte has created an entirely plastic-free oral care set, and most recently released the first ever 100% plastic-free deodorant with compostable refills. Lindsay's also appeared on Shark Tank, which we'll talk about, and turning down a six-figure deal from both Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary and was named as one of Fast Company's most creative people. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Lindsay Corbin. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Alan. I'm really excited. I know. I, I'm excited to learn more about your company and, and your journey for that matter. But before we do that, I hear you love being outside. What's your favorite activity? I do. I really like anything that's outdoor and active, but actually this weekend I went uh, dirt biking here right outside Los Angeles with our director of operations, a woman named Sarah, and we had a lot of fun. It was super good to just get back outside and be out in nature and be able to see there was actually some snow on the ground and we were in the desert, which is really crazy to see. Uh, And it was a really good time. Anything outdoors and active, I love. I've never seen snow in the desert. (laughs) I know. It's very strange. It's a very strange thing to see. And dirt biking, you've already, I I don't do things that adventurous myself. (laughs) You've trumped me already. There's a whole world out there, Alan. (laughs) There's a whole world. It was like the one thing I grew up not 
doing. I did go karting and and we did four wheeling and things like that. But like uh, the two wheel thing, you've got me beat. It's a little bit more challenging, but it's very fun. Tell me, where'd you get your start? And what was this path to founding your company, Byte? Yeah. So it was definitely more of a winding path. So when I graduated college, I was a surf and snowboard instructor out here in Los Angeles. LA is one of the few places in the world that you can surf in the morning and then go snowboarding in the afternoon because it's only about an hour and a half away from the beach to the mountains. So I would live six months at the beach and then six months up at Big Bear. And uh, that's what I was doing my first few years out here. I, I knew I wanted to work in TV. So I was working as a production assistant on really any unscripted show that I could get on. I wanted to work in documentaries specifically, like nature documentaries, conservation documentaries. And that was the the beginning of living in LA. And I ended up traveling a little bit in my late 20s and then coming back and working as an assistant actually in for an unscripted production company. And that was the beginning, beginning of my career before I ended up getting into Byte. I went from TV to toothpaste, which is not a normal trajectory. I'll tell you that. No, we'll find more about that. So what was the spark to go from TV and potentially this really aspirational passion to to build documentaries to toothpaste? I know it's more similar than you would think. So, so I was working for a show called House Hunters, and I was traveling every like every other week. I was on a plane um, for work, and I was building up my toolkit in unscripted because you can't just like make a documentary. Maybe some people can, but I wanted to be able to know how do you put a show together, how do you tell stories, how do you do all these things. So, I was working my way up in TV and traveling all the time. And I'd always lived a low waste lifestyle. I've been passionate about like conservation and the environment, but then I was throwing out these little toothpaste tubes and I had my little shampoo bottles and face wash bottles and I would refill those every week, but I was throwing out the the tube. And so I was like, you know what? I just want to find an alternative to this like this little piece of plastic that I'm throwing out every week. And turns out there really wasn't anything out there that was, wasn't in plastic and that had ingredients that weren't harmful for our bodies and the planet. And so that's the beginning of being like, this product doesn't exist and I want to use it. So I'll just try making it. And uh, I really, it wasn't, I didn't start it to start a business. It was more to honestly fill this need. I had tried tooth powders and I wasn't a fan. I had tried, there was a few other tooth tablet brands on the market at the time, but they were packaged in plastic or had ingredients that weren't really great. And so I was like, what if I made this and I made it entirely plastic free if I took out all of the bad ingredients and used things that you know were safe and effective, I ended up taking online chemistry classes, talking to dentists and dental hygienists until finally uh, started pressing out these dry toothpaste tablets that I put in a glass jar with compostable refill pouches. So it, it seems super random, but when you look back, you're like, that all actually makes sense. Like I can see how, how that all happened. <laughs> you definitely saw the problem. You didn't find any solution and you're like, I'm just going to make this myself. Yeah, exactly. I know it's a lot harder than just saying that. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's talk about Byte in general as the company and describe the company for me. And what are you doing and for who? Byte stands for because it's the earth and everything that we do is to be better to the planet, the bo- our bodies and people. We're really transparent with our ingredients and, and how our product's made. We're made here in the US, so we pay fair and livable wages. Everything that we have is cruelty-free, palm oil-free, and plastic-free. And it's we're, we basically are reimagining our daily routines to be better for our bodies and the planet. That's essentially what we do. And I think a lot of companies, especially in the oral care space and the personal care space, believe that people want something like cheap and convenient at all costs. And we don't believe that. We believe that people really want to do better. They want stuff that's better for the planet and that they do care and products for people like that. And we really go above and beyond where we're, we're always trying to look at how can we be better as a company, whether it's we went carbon neutral last year, we went palm oil free two years ago. We're constantly looking through our process and our supply chain and figuring out how we can be better even as we grow. So that's something that's been really start, like important to me from the beginning and has been really exciting as we continue to scale. It sounds like you started with toothpaste because that was the first problem that you saw. What other products do you have now? So we have an entirely plastic-free oral care line. So we have our toothpaste, we have a bamboo toothbrush, floss, we have mouthwash tablets, and we're the first ever plastic-free whitening gel. 
Uh, and then we just last year in September released our plastic free deodorant. So it comes in this really beautiful mirror finished aluminum tin or like aluminum case. And then the, it has a compostable refill that you can put in it. So it's the first plastic free deodorant to ever have a compostable refill like this. And it's just, I wanted something that not only was effective and palm oil free and, and all checks all the boxes. That's that we do, but also something that's really beautiful and that you wanted to travel with, that you wanted to have on your bathroom counter. So we went all out and we're really happy with it. We have a three three different scents that we created there and we have transparency in our fragrance where we list out all of the ingredients in our fragrances. And it's been really fun. That was our first kind of foray into something outside of oral care. And it was a fun thing for the team to tackle. To your point about those little tubes of toothpaste, I think about the deodorant that I use. I, I haven't tried yours yet. And I say yet, but there's a lot of plastic in deodorant packaging, if you think about it. And every little thing is a plastic doodad and they don't separate. You can't recycle it. And yeah, and there's, it's actually 15 million pounds of deodorant plastic uh, packaging per year is made and, and discarded. So it's, it's a lot. And that's something that's the backbone of our company is that our daily habits really do add up. It doesn't seem, it's the idea that one person can make a difference and that these small things that we do every day really do have high impact. And so we want to make things that are easy and convenient and beautiful and effective, and then also better for the planet and our bodies. So yeah, it's, and same with the toothpaste tubes. You don't think about, you just throw out a toothpaste tube, but over 1 billion are thrown out every year and a lot of them end up in our you know, landfills, oceans, ecosystems. And I think people are really starting to look for other alternatives to these wasteful habits that we've had, that we've grown up with. Let's go back to how you started this business and focusing. You, you started in your living room is my understanding. <laughs> you came from film. You knew the problem. You experienced the problem yourself, but you're not a chemist as best I can tell. So where did you start? And like, how did you start? Honestly, like Reddit and YouTube, like I was just looking things up. I went on Reddit and there was this thread that was like, here's how you can take open source chemistry classes online from like senior year of high school to an, a PhD in organic chemistry. So I was like, cool, I'm going to take some of these classes. So I have an understanding of how this is all going to interact. And then I was hitting up every dentist and dental hygienist I had ever gone to school with, whether it was high school or college on Facebook being like, hey, would you take 20 minutes and just hop on the phone with me on my way to work? Can we chat? Can I like walk through a few ideas that I have on ingredients and what your thoughts are on these things? And then I actually, I had to learn how to tablet. So tableting is like a, a, a science in its own. Uh, you're dealing with particle size. You're dealing with a lot of different different factors. And so I actually flew to Texas and learned how to tablet for this like master tablet person. <laughs> and I bought this machine and I was pressing it out in my, pressing them out in my living room. So yeah, it was definitely, it was quite the learning process, but I was really into it. I thought it was really fun. It was a fun thing. To, it was a fun challenge. And it was one of those things too, is that once I started putting money into it, I was like, I can't turn back now. I just spent $200 on these different ingredients. And I just spent money on a flight to Texas and I just spent money on this thing. So was, I kept getting in deeper and deeper that I was like, I'm going to figure out how to make this work. Uh, and I'm glad that I did, but that's how it all started. When did you pull the ripcord on income? Was it right away? You had some savings or were you working along this time too, where you're trying to learn chemistry and talk to your dentist friends? I was working. I had no social life. <laughs> like it was, I would go to work at my TV job from nine in the morning until six or seven at night. And then I'd work on bite from eight until midnight or 2 a.m. And then I'd wake up and I would do it all again. And I loved it. It felt like kind of an art. It was like a hobby. Before this, I was making YouTube videos. I had a YouTube travel channel on YouTube and it was I said YouTube like three times, uh, but it was like, it was really fun. And I was making these videos. And so I was already accustomed to working at work and then working on something that was a passion after work. And I had wrapped up that YouTube channel and then I started Bite. And so I think it was something where it was just like, I liked having something, a hobby to do after work. I liked working on and creating things. And it was really important to me, especially at the beginning, that I wasn't trying to feed myself from this company. And this is advice that I give to anybody who's looking at maybe starting in a business or being an entrepreneur. I, I think there's so much advice out there saying, if you don't quit your job and go for it, you're not a real entrepreneur and you're never going to make it. And I actually think that's really not great advice because the idea is that 
You have this little baby bird of a company and it's so important, especially at the beginning, to protect it and to make the right choices and to not sacrifice things. If you have to choose between feeding the bird or yourself, like it's not a good position to be in. And so I was able to work my day job, funnels that money into Byte and then build Byte the way that I really wanted to. And it was a lot of work, but also that kind of work ethic is really what it takes to have a growing company anyway. So it really served me well, even after Byte took off. So you're in your living room at night, tableting, <laughs> if you will, pushing this stuff out. Was there a moment where you were like, I think I've got it? Maybe you <laughs> made this thing. Or... <laughs> it still hasn't happened. You still don't feel that way. <laughs> It's always a work in progress. We say it's iterative. I always thought, I always think it's good enough and it can always be better. And I think that's a really healthy way to, to look at things is that when I first launched it, I brought some to work and I had everyone try it and I thought it tasted fine and the reviews came in and they were, it was not so good. It was not minty enough. And so it was, then I had to make it more minty. And so constantly tweaking it, constantly making it a little bit more foamy, a little less foamy, a little bit more minty or less minty. And so we're constantly improving little tiny tweaks here and there as we go, I definitely think it's important. So you're creating a business and somewhere along the way, Shark Take enters the equation. Tell me like how that came about and what that experience was like. So back in 2018, we had done a video for our women's health on Facebook. And so it was literally me talking to uh, an iPhone at six in the morning before I left for a TV shoot because I was still working in TV. And we sent it in and this video ended up going just totally viral. So it had over 2 million views in the first few hours it was up. We had done over $200,000 in sales and it was like, wow, this really has launched the company from this making it in my living room, pressing out these tablets to being like, I need a manufacturer. Like I need business insurance. I need, this is a real business now. And at that time, that video got the attention of, I assume that video got the attention of the Shark Tank casting producers. So they had reached out to me, but it was at the, at that time, it was just so crazy. Like it was things with Bite had just exploded. I was still working full-time in TV and I really had to wrangle things in. And the following season that they were like, okay, we'll reach back out to you then. So they did. And they're really upfront with, even if casting reaches out to you for your business, you don't have a better or worse chance of getting on the show. It's just that they do have a casting team and they're looking for people. I applied and we got on and it was a wild ride. I would say that anybody who has a business should run the practice thinking that they're going to be on Shark Tank because it really makes you think if I'm going to stand up in front of the sharks in all of America and explain my business, like what would I say to make them care or like at the very least not get ripped apart? And I think it was like a really helpful thing to, to think about. Now you get on the show, you get offers, but you turn them down. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we turned them down. <laughs> so we got an offer from Mark Cuban and from Kevin O'Leary. It's the art of negotiation. Like we had already went on with what, what I felt was like a very fair deal. And we just, we couldn't get there. And I didn't want to start a partnership if it didn't feel fair. We unfortunately had to say no, but the experience itself was amazing. That's amazing. I, and good for you to turn down a bad deal in your mind. So Yeah, that's a guy to protect the company at all costs. So Exactly. I think more people should should consider that myself when I watch the show. But so you've got a company, you are running it and it's hairs on fire. You probably still feel like this to many days, I'm, I'm sure in different ways now, you probably have more people with hair on fire. How do you think about marketing and finding people to consume your products? We've been really lucky since the beginning of just having incredibly organic word of mouth. And that's something that we've always prioritized because it's, it's the lifeblood of our company. It's how we started. And I think the reason that we're able to maintain that is that we take transparency very seriously. We explain the choices that we make and why we make them. I, I, like personally, right? Like very long blog posts, why I've made these choices of what ingredients we're using and why this material that we're using and why I chose it over this. And the reason I do that is because not many people read it, hardly anyone does, but the people who do are the biggest advocates because they're the ones who are really curious about that. And then what they do is if you have the kind of very curious personality where this is something that's really something that you're into, you then also are 
most likely the kind of person that will tell your friends and pass this word along. And so, and that's honestly the way I am. Like I research the heck out of everything. And then I'm also the one with all the recommendations for my friends on things. And I feel like I'm speaking to myself a lot of times with these things of, and really letting our customers know why we're doing this and, you know, why we've made these choices. And I think it's been incredibly beneficial, um, especially in this new world of iOS 14 and constantly ever growing CAC. We're still able to just be able to go back to basics and really rely on um, our message and the our mission and being able to have advocates in our corner for that. So you talked about digital marketing, like the blog post, the S- I'm sure there's SEO benefits to that, as well as not only empowering your advocates to advocate on your behalf through the word of mouth. It sounds like you've used in your other career, you used uh, YouTube, you had that viral video, go gangbusters. Are you using influencers and other social platforms as well? Yeah. If it's out there, we're doing it and we're testing it. That is, I think one of the great things about being super small and scrappy is that you can be really fast. And so we're constantly looking for where can we be before anybody else? Where can we look to talk to people before other brands have you know, entered the space? Because when you're our size going up against the Crest and Colgates of the world, like when it comes to things, you know, that where you can get perf- perfect attribution, right? Like a Facebook or an Instagram where you're starting to see where at one point you were able to see how you can basically where your dollars are going and what their, what their return is, the bigger the budgets, the more advantage you have in that space. So if you're smaller and scrappier, there's not massive advantages there. But where you do have advantages is that you can be really fast and you can try things before other people do. And then once the big guys get in to move on and look for the new frontier, essentially. One of the things that we say internally is that we're not necessarily looking for perfect attribution. It's not something that when that's something that we need because we know that once there is perfect attribution, that's when all of the money goes into it. It's way more than what we have. Like the the big guys get in and then it blows out the space. We were on TikTok before. Now everybody's on TikTok, but I think it's the idea of looking for the muddy water because that's where the opportunity is. So we're constantly looking for the new places that we can go where we can talk to our customers, where we can, you know, talk about our message because it's so, it's so much more important than just our brand. It's going plastic free. It's changing your daily routines. And so we're constantly looking where we can can tell that story and where we can be first. And very smart to look at the muddy water and not focus too much on attribution. Because you, to your point, you don't know what's going to work, uh, especially if it's early days. I know you don't want to give away any secrets, any any tips for digital marketers about like how you've changed using something. Again, I know you don't want to give away any proprietary secrets. They're expensive to learn. <laughs> but exactly. I will say, <laughs> and that's the thing. But I will say like that the best advice that I could give would just be, and that's the same thing with investing, right? If everybody's doing it, it's probably not the place to be. <laughs> it's like, or where, or like when people are greedy, be scared, or people are scared, be greedy, or whatever those sayings are, where if everybody's running to something, there, the opportunity is probably elsewhere if you were a small brand. And so that's what something that we're constantly uh, remembering and looking for and just being being able to experiment with money that you're comfortable experimenting with will pay off dividends. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, like small brands, if they can do it and find the angle that actually PR works pretty well. Do you have any experience with that as a, like a channel earned media, so to speak? I think, yeah, I think earned media is amazing. I think that it's, it's definitely something that we believe in. So I think you know, we've been Again, really lucky to have a lot of organic PR and word of mouth, but also I just, yeah, I think it's totally, especially when you're a small brand, because it helps give a little bit more legitimacy, right? It's not, you're not just a Facebook brand at that point. You're a brand that's in Martha Stewart Living or Fast Company and Entrepreneur. And I think those are the types of things that adds legitimacy, especially in the small to medium playing space. It's been fun. I still don't know how you figured it all out. Honestly, I, I like I, just the thought of going on Reddit and trying to figure out chemistry in general it blows my mind away. So congrats on the success you've had so far. It's quite amazing. I have to try out the deodorant. Yeah. After this, send me your address and we'll send you some. I am more than happy. I would love for you to try it out. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in trying that out. But anyway, besides free samples, let's talk a little bit more about you. We we know you're hair on fire entrepreneur, but I want to try to unpack a little bit more. What experience have you had in your past that makes you who you are today? I would say a lot of it 
It's interesting. So I think coming from a TV background, I think that has been incredibly beneficial to running a company because my job was no matter what happened, it, it didn't matter. I needed to get it done. I needed to get it done on budget, on time with a smile on my face. <laughs> because like when you're producing a scene, directing a scene, and you're working especially with unscripted, you know, they're not actors, they're people. So if you're even remotely stressed or annoyed or something's going wrong and you start sending out that vibe, they're going to clam up and it's going to, it's just going to make the situation exponentially worse. And so it was something where I was, I had learned from uh, the TV background that like, no one cares if you're sick, no one cares, you know, I'd be on a shoot and I'd be like, oh my God, I have food poisoning and it doesn't matter. I have to wake up tomorrow and I have to get the shoot done because there's no one else with you. It's just you on the ground. You know what I'm saying? It's like you and a camera person and an audio. And I think that there's an incredible amount of discipline that comes with that and being able to meet deadlines and really be able to execute at a high level while still maintaining happiness. So like liking it and feeling in flow, I think was incredibly helpful being able, I tell my friends who are in TV, I'm like, if you know how to produce a show, you can produce a company. Like it's, they're very similar. And then I would also say from surfing and snowboarding and even dirt biking the other day is that it's, it's when you're putting yourself in these kind of high stress situations that are really fun, but also sometimes you have minimal control, right? Of what happens with the wave or the the trail or, and I think that those types of, if you like that kind of adrenaline and if you like that yeah, activity, it, it lends itself very well to also running a company because it's, it's very, they're really very similar. I think about that on a pretty regular basis and kind of to, to get beat down on a, on a hill or on a trail and then get up and do it again is a really good lesson in business as well. Cause there's a lot that will knock you down, but it's all about getting back up and just doing it again and, and enjoying the whole process. So I would say that although I would have never thought TV or surfing or snowboarding or dirt biking had anything to do with running companies, I actually think it's very relevant to who I am today. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this life all over again? This is a little cliche, but it's true. Like the dots will all connect. Just go with it. It seems so random, but it will all connect. <laughs> so just enjoy and learn as much as you can along the way. This show is mostly marketers are listening to this. And so I'm curious if there's a topic you think marketers need to be learning more about or you're trying to learn more about itself. Here's the thing. And I know I was speaking to entrepreneurs the entire time, but I feel like ever it's all the same marketing entrepreneur. And we're all kind of doing the same thing. So I would say that something that I think is so overlooked right now is having a direct relationship to your customer. So I block out every Friday for an hour where I, I literally call up two different customers, whether I've pulled it from our customer support emails or social media, and I talk to them. And I have a huge spreadsheet of all of the stuff that I've learned. And I think that it is just so incredibly important to actually get that real-time feedback on the phone. I think a lot of times we look at data, a lot of times we look at cohorts and we look at Instagram likes and all of these different analytics that are just so dehumanizing. And it's just so incredibly helpful. I think it's made me a better product developer. I think it's made me better at everything, just getting on the phone and actually talking to people. And so I think that if you're in marketing and you really want to learn about the people you're trying to market to, get on the phone and talk. It's scary. I didn't want to do it at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually fun. And it's actually, it's now like one of my most favorite parts of the week, just because I learned so much and our customers are amazing. I love that. That's excellent advice. And now I know why you're so successful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the biggest tip that I've given. <laughs> just kidding. It doesn't cost you a thing. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs you an hour of your time. You'd be surprised as companies get bigger, a lot of people lose that. And a lot of executives that are running the companies or running the brands lose that connection to their customer. So kudos to you. Two more questions for you. Curious if there's like on a personal note, like brands or companies or causes that you're following and you think other people should take notice of. Yeah, absolutely. I love Patagonia. I think they're like the OG sustainable brand. They even say they're not a sustainable brand, but they're pretty dang impressive. And I love, I think that what they've built is great. And the a book that their founder wrote called Let My People Go Surfing, I just think is amazing. There's also a really important act that's up for a vote. It's the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act of 2021. And, I, and it's now 2022 as well. <laughs> and I think it's uh, really exciting to see like an actual act that's up that's wanting to start making an impact on plastic pollution. And I think it's really exciting that this is even in existence, even up for vote. And the more that we learn about it and that we've 
we're trying to support it. I just think it's very cool that this, the conversation, it, it takes a long time for conversations to go from people to activism mainstream to actually in government where we're actually being able to vote on things. And it's uh, pretty exciting that we got there. I feel like the conversation really started 2017 or so, and to already have something to be voted on is really exciting. That's amazing. Is that local or is that national? I don't know the act. No, it's national. I'll have to look into it. You can call your reps and uh, tell them to show up. I sit here not too far from Washington, D.C. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah. Or email if you don't feel comfortable calling. I know people don't want to call, so you can always email. That's easy too. (laughs) Last question for you. What do you feel like is the largest opportunity or threat to marketers today? How fast it moves. Holy cow. It is every time you turn around, there's some new app and there's there's something new. And so I think that is for sure the challenge and the opportunity. Because again, we touched on attribution, we touched on wanting to get there first. And then and I think that's easily be flipped to where if you have no attribution, you're blowing your money or you're first and there's no one there, that's also not great. So I think it's definitely this, it's a pretty it's a fast paced world out there. And I think it takes a lot. We, it's, <laughs> I don't know. I feel it's like, what a wild time to be a marketer. <laughs> like, I, I think it's, but at the same point, when there's the chaos that's like this, like with the iOS 14, that, that literally chaos is opportunity. That is what it is. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the landscape and it's just, who's going to, how do you get there and how do you get your company there? And what do you do once you're there? Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.